there. Can we talk about Beastars? Debuting in 2016 by Paku Itagaki, Beastars takes place in a modern world similar to ours where a variety of anthropomorphic animals live within a class divided between carnivore and herbivore. Lagosi, a large but introverted and socially awkward wolf, is a student at Cherryton Academy who, like all nerdy introverted high schoolers, is on the tech team at the school's drama department. After a fellow classmate is mysteriously killed and eaten, Lagosi finds himself grappling with his own identity as a carnivore and his own desires as an adolescent male upon meeting Haru, a socially ostracized rabbit. Since its debut, the series has risen to critical acclaim with over a million copies sold. In 2019, the anime debuted thanks to Orange of Land of Lustrous Acclaim, showing that in the right hands, <coughs> CGI anime can be done very well. The anime utilizes a ton of amazing techniques, including a full-on stop-motion theme with a fucking bop of a theme song. I think because of the misleading high school aesthetic and the fact that even though it's the year of our lord 2020, people are still hung up on furries, it's easy to write off Beastars as some Zootopia but anime. It's a story with themes of instinct and nature, along with see certain animals or certain allegories to marginalize people themes. It's one of the few anime series I've been into where sex is a constant theme in the series, both figuratively and literally, with themes of desire and consumption often being very heavily a metaphor for sex, or sometimes just a straight up plot point. And it makes the series more akin to something like Hannibal. On top of all this, because I'm sure there's 100 videos out there breaking down what makes the series good, I wanted to talk about the actual animals in the show and how as an animal enthusiast myself, there's a good amount of the show's zoology and animal behavior that gets it very right. Mm, some that, well, work. it works good for storytelling. The first part will cover certain plot points and the aspects already introduced in the anime, and the second part will cover plot points that have only been revealed in the manga, so just a heads up if you're only watching the anime or you haven't gotten that far into the manga and you want to be surprised. Um, Alright, here we go! A huge plot point in Beastars is, is that despite the cravings and desires for meat, the carnivores in this world are able to live on substitutions for their needs of protein such as soy and eggs. And this is sort of possible. It, it depends on the species of carnivore. Carnivores such as dogs and bears are called um, faculative carnivores, meaning that while meat plays an important part in their diet, they can consume other types of food for nutrients and consume other types of non-meat for proteins such as eggs. However, you get certain animals such as lions, and these are called obligate carnivores, and their body requires essential amino acids that can only be consumed in the form of meat. Outside of some very expensive reverse engineering of certain non-meat and soy proteins, it wouldn't be possible to expect these animals to simply go vegetarian. At Charrington Academy, Lugosi lives in a canine dorm with all his super adorable canine pals, including two dogs, a fennec fox, a coyote, and a hyena. Wait. Okay, don't tell the hyena this. He isn't actually a canine. He's part of the Filiformia family. Or cat and cat-like carnivores. Felines are weird because half of them go off and they kind of become like cat praxis. And then you got this whole bunch of other guys that go off and they're like cat theory. And they consist of a ton of weird animals you might be familiar with, such as meerkat, mongoose, fusa, and binturong. So yeah, he, he doesn't actually belong in that dorm room. Rabbits as a symbol of fertility have existed in cultures ranging from the Celtics to the Aztecs, and therefore it makes sense to have Haru be a promiscuous character. In so many animes where the heroine is either portrayed as a highly sexualized but still virginal waifu where their promiscuity or sexual desires are played for laughs, Haru is a very refreshing character who enjoys acts of intimacy because she finds it one of the few times where she feels understood and valued as opposed to condescended and doted on. Let's talk about how much fucking a rabbit can do with a common ecological teaching, RK selection theory. While there are now other theories of study, RK collection theory was held in high regard for a very long time, and it's just the easiest one that I understand and I can explain to y'all. It's essentially 
two different types of survival strategy in terms of reproduction. R is that you can have a ton of babies, as many as possible. And even if only a few make it to sexual maturity and have offspring despite living very short lifespans, you've spread your genetic code. Good for you. K is to have very small amounts of offspring on the idea that if you invest all of your time and energy in ensuring its survival, you have a good chance of passing your genes along, especially with long-lived offspring. While certain animals go against this theory, sea turtles, for example, lay a ton of eggs with very few making it into adulthood, but also have very long lifespans. It explains a lot about the mating behavior of rabbits. Rabbits' reproduction rhythms last anywhere from 14 to 16 days, with only one or two where she's unable to breed. Smaller species of rabbits, such as the dwarf rabbit, come into sexual maturity as young as four and a half months. Pregnancies last around a month, with litters being around four of a smaller species. Females are fertile again immediately after giving birth, so in theory, a rabbit could have up to 16 kits per year. So early in the series, Lugosi meets Gohan, a back alley doctor in the black market of the city who acts as a mix of Lugosi's mentor, doctor, and tormentor. There's a reason I love Gohan, and it's because he throws every single stereotype we know about pandas out the window. Pity the poor panda. A quick Google will take you into a rabbit hole of poor societal notions about them. Yes, I think they're cute, but they have also quickly become himbo-fied. Pandas are stupid. Pandas are lazy. Pandas can't fuck. Pandas have small penises. Pandas can do kung fu if they work really hard and believe in themselves. Pandas will give up their baby for a tasty treat. Whom among us? Why have we wasted millions and billions of dollars on these stuffed animals if they can't even meet us halfway to preserve the species? If I can teach you anything in this video today, I want it to be this. Pandas are bears. Yes, one of the smaller species, but you are looking at a 350 pound animal that can bite right through bamboo like a tasty, tasty mozzarella stick. The only two bears of stronger bite force are the grizzly bear and polar bear. There's a few documented cases of pandas attacking people who have tried to get into their enclosures at various zoos, and you are very free to Google those injuries if you're morbidly curious. Like me, I did it. Despite our history of white girls wearing its wine o'clock t-shirts loudly proclaiming that pandas are their spirit animals, when you look at it objectively, this animal is terrifying. So how did this animal become established as a lazy buffoon? Well, let's go back to basics with their diet. Pandas didn't know easy eat bamboo. And as a bear, they are order carnivora and have a digestive tract much more similar to ours than a herbivore. But as far as we can theorize, around two million years ago, there was possibly a massive famine in the region that pandas lived. And much like one eats a jar of capers, because it's the only thing left in the fridge. It's 1 a.m. and you're drunk. The panda began to eat bamboo as a means to survive. Two million years later, and the panda has gone vegan, even developing a pseudo thumb, a non mobile extension of the wrist bone to help it hold down bamboo as it eats it. Pandas, on average, consume anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds of bamboo daily, effectively absorbing huge amounts of protein in the bamboo and defecating out the rest. Pandas poop about 100 times a day. But where did the notion that pandas are all incels come from? Well, like all bears, pandas are solidary in nature, and female pandas only go into heat once a year, for like three days. This means that a male panda will have to leave his territory consisting of 1.9 square miles and hopefully find said female panda in time to mate. If he does reach the female in time, he will most likely encounter other male pandas who have gathered there as well. The pandas will fight until one chad panda is able to successfully drive off the virgin pandas and mate. In human care, however, due to what we think might be a lack of assertiveness of some sort, male pandas are not as successful. So pandas not being able to fuck is merely a byproduct of having them in our care. In the wild, pandas do fuck. The thing about them having very small penises is correct, though. horns that are permanent and are composed of bone and keratin, same, same thing your fingernails are made out of, antlers on members of the cervidae family, aka deer, elk, moose, etc., are only temporary. But why? Well, antlers are primarily used for bucks to compete for mates when they're in rut, which is like the deer version of pond far. Antlers are made up of honeycomb bone-like tissue that are attached to mounts called the pedicle. 
During rut, the huge amounts of testosterone hold the pedicle in place as the male and deer sets out to smash. But once breeding season is over, the testosterone levels drop. This turns all the Chad deer once again into virgin deer. And the lack of testosterone weakens the pedicle and it causes the antlers to shed off until they regrow again. <laughs> One of the crazier twists in the show comes later on when everyone's favorite brooding deer senpai, Lewis, returns um, after going missing for a while and you learn he's become the new leader of the Shishigumi, basically like this Yakuza-esque group of lions. And you learn the lions like love Lewis and they're all like super, super attached to him. Side note, I love all the lion, like I love the lion's look. I love how their manes are all kind of styled to look like, like hairdos from like some old Yakuza movie. <laughs> Also, lions being very needy is fairly accurate as they are the only sociable species of feline. In the wild, you have a male and a group of females, but once a lion leaves his group, if he's unable to find any mates, he will find other male lions to associate with. These groups are called coalitions. Some have become incredibly famous, such as the Savo Maneaters to the Mapogo Lion Coalition, which consisted of six fucking lions that spent seven years overthrowing various lion prides and taking over 170,000 acres of the Kruger National Park. The reign came to an end after they were overthrown by a slightly smaller coalition that led to the death of two of the lions in that pride, Kinky Tail and Mr. T. Um, if you're curious about the names of the lions in this coalition, uh, their names were Makulu, Rasta, Dreadlocks, Pretty Boy, Kinky Tail, and Mr. T. <laughs> the original podcast. <laughs> twist comes later on in the story where we learn that Lugosi is actually only three-fourths wolf and we are introduced to his non-wolf grandfather Gosha, a Komodo dragon. He's considered highly dangerous not just due to his carnivore status but because his poisonous breath can be toxic to those around him. So full disclaimer, venom and poison are different things. I personally like to quote Ava Max's Sweet But Psycho lyrics where she states that the focus of the song is poison but tasty correctly suggesting that poison needs to be consumed or touched in order to have an effect. Venom is slightly more complex because it needs to get into your bloodstream in order to have an effect. So say either stung or bitten. And as happy as I am to see a reptilian character in a show who isn't portrayed as evil, this isn't really how Komodo Dragon Venom works. So in 1969, a biologist named Walter Offenberg moved to the island of Komodo to study these chonky lizards. He observed the dragons for a year and in 1981 published a book saying that the Komodo dragons used an unusual amount of bacteria in their mouth to subdue and hunt down prey. But the problem is, hypothesis and observation aside, there was no actual evidence for this. Studies done later on even showed the Komodo dragons had no unusual amount of bacteria in their mouths. However, further studies did conclude that the saliva itself was venomous. The venom is beneficial to a hunting Komodo dragon as the venom lowers blood pressure and prevents blood from clotting. This is bad for you because a Komodo dragon can smell blood almost six miles away. However, like all venom, it has no ill effect unless injected into the body, so Gosha's venom isn't completely accurate. learned something from this video today. I love animals and I love anime. So I couldn't resist a chance to return to the wild world of YouTube and chat a bit about the series. The anime sadly lost some of its momentum in the West due to the huge gap between its release in Japan and its release in the US due to Netflix having licensing and their policy is only releasing the anime once it's completed its seasonal run in Japan. However, the manga is available by Viz Media and the anime will be out on Netflix March 13th. So if you haven't checked out Beastars and you made it all the way through this video, um, I'd, I'd say you got some options now. Is there any other animals in Beastar you were curious about or what about other anime with animal themes you'd care to know about? Let me know in the comments below. And yes, I still plan on doing a Dora Hidoro anime video, it just might take some time as much like Beastars here. Dora Hidoro is also stuck in Netflix purgatory for the time being. I do want to say hi to all the new subscribers, I um, hope you'll stick around for this. If you want to check me out on some other non-YouTube things, I'm the anime correspondent currently on Struggle Session. We uh, discuss a whole bunch of media on that. I'll put the link to Patreon below. And um, yeah, I hope you'll stick around and see what else I'm coming out with. Well, that's all for today. 
Thanks for letting me talk about Beastars. Yeah!